I'm ultra excited for this talk. Truly, truly excited because um, in the past we've we've done these things and we've done the Java ones and the DevOpses and and they're all fun and uh, we normally try and um, preach uh, we try and preach a line of accessibility and simplicity and when you're doing that um, sometimes the message can come off as a little bit soft. So while we've really appreciated the people that have appreciated our types of talks, we, we sometimes get feedback that maybe we're glazing over something or it's not as complex as it can be. And in this particular talk, um, we're going to dig into what we believe are kind of the warts of the EE platform. It's not necessarily the, the um, it's not an infallible thing by any stretch of the imagination. And it can be difficult to develop on in some ways. It's gotten a lot better over the years. Um, but we're going to show some of the cases today that we feel are both difficult to develop and to test. And we'll try and show you why we believe that testing isn't some other thing that you do separate to development. It should really be central to your process. And when it becomes central to your process, it actually does make it easier to develop. And, and you save so much time over the long run. Um, at least that's my experience. And that could be because I'm a very slow coder to begin with. So testing the stuff isn't going to add all that much uh, for me. Um, my name is Andrew Rubinger. I'm a senior software engineer with JBoss. I've worked on the application server for a few years. Lately, I've gone more into usability type projects. Um, joined with my colleague, Ashlak Knutsen, who's joining us from Oslo, also a JBoss engineer and the lead of the Archelian platform, which we'll be looking at in a little bit today. Um, so I think you know, we should get through some of the more conceptual stuff first, just so that we're all on board. And then we're going to try and do as many of these demos as we can. But again, I'm, we're not going to rush through any of the demos to be able to fit them all. I think we'll just try and feel it out and make sure that we're testing all the cases we want. And um, if you have questions or concerns or anything related to, like shout them out because the feedback helps us. This talk mirrors a book that we're writing and we want the book to be reflecting what the real user use cases are. And honestly, like the inspiration for all of that has been the feedback we've gotten over the years. So we'll kick in. Um, reasons to not test or some of our preconceptions about testing include that it's uh, too hard or that it's too slow and it takes up way too much time and most importantly that it's not fun. Honestly, things can be hard, time consuming and slow, but if they're fun, you're going to do them in your spare time anyway. Um, and what we really need to do is, is enable this to be a much more enjoyable experience uh, for us all. So one of our friends and community contributors, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Norris, came up with a quote, um, which is, it's like, I wanted to steal it, but I think he wrote it somewhere publicly, so I, like, we got to attribute it to him somehow. Um, and uh, what he said is, the purpose of automated testing is to enable change. And verifying correctness is just a nice side effect. And when I start to think about this, I think about maybe um, the, the six weeks that I worked with, with Corel here um, over um, completely refactoring an API and the implementation as well, and uh, continually rebasing it atop of current work. And what we did was we ported the test suite into the new stuff so we had functionally equivalent coverage and then squashed it all into like one big mega commit uh, or at least one mega push. I think it was still many commits, but they all went in at the same time and we like pushed it, tested it, and released it all in the same day. And the reason that we were able to put in this like 5,000 line change all at once without any fear of breaking like existing functions is because we had a decent test suite to begin with that was going to give us coverage and we, we kind of knew like, all right, this stuff is all apparently still working, so I mean, let's, let's go right ahead. Testing is development, or it should be, I think, if you're doing it right. A lot of people will talk about test-driven development. It comes uh, from the Agile community and before that from extreme programming. And um, a lot of people say that with test-driven development, you know, you stub out your API and then you write your tests and then you develop. I'm actually not going to advocate for that specifically. I think whatever your process is, be it iterative or be it test-first or 
you know, even if you just want to put everything in place first and then make sure that you got your coverage later, whatever works for you, I say as long as it's, when it goes into the code base, it all goes in together and you've got coverage to ensure that it works, then great. Um, this is for a few reasons. Um, I'll hang on this slide for a second. This is for a few reasons. One is, yes, it's for the coverage. It's also, it makes you a user of your API. And the second you start to write tests, and you, the developer, not like someone else in QA whose job is to just do testing. That's, that's really not QA's job. You, as the developer, write tests for the APIs that you're writing. You immediately get a sense of how it's being used. Is it too verbose? Is it clear? Is it concise? Does it make sense? And a lot of times you don't see that until you actually start to type things in and see the IDE autocomplete it or pop up advice. And, and these things can be really helpful in informing your decisions in doing your software design. Um, we talk about testing, we'll talk about a few different types. Uh, there's acceptance testing. This is kind of a business level thing where you've got business requirements. And so you'll write like really high level tests to show that you can meet those business requirements. And they're generally you know, accepted by the people who are demanding the business requirements. So you might have something like, really, really high level user can create a new account and it sends an email and registers everyone in the database, right? That'd be like an acceptance test. There's compatibility testing to make sure that eh, maybe you've got two different pieces of software and they need to interoperate you know, between contracts. Maybe you've just got two versions of the same thing. Um, in the shrink wrap project, I have compatibility tests for wire compatibility that ensure that um, the wire protocol is forwards, compatible, uh, is forwards compatible when we do serialization over the network. I want to make sure that it's forward and backwards compatible so that when we put new fields in, it doesn't break older versions that are of the same major release version. Uh, we got the functional tests. Um, again, kind of high level, but like in the middle there. I mean, uh, I generally don't label things necessarily as uh, functional, a lot of people do, they'll go functional system and they, they cut them up um, really small in, in terms of where the responsibility begins and ends. Um, I'm definitely not that strict when it comes to my uh, definitions. There's black box testing, um, which is so named because uh, say you're testing some sort of an object from the outside, then what you do is you send the request in and you get some sort of a response back and that's where you begin and end. You don't know anything that's going on inside of the box. Um, conversely, there's white box testing where maybe you do have access to the internals of this thing and you can see at a more fine-grained level what's going on on the inside and kind of poke at those internals to make sure that they're all working as expected too. One isn't necessarily better than the other. They just have different needs and purposes. So if you're doing maybe a web service and it's like a RESTful service, probably you want a black box thing to test the endpoints. Send a client request, make sure you get the response. That's all you care about as a client. But if you're doing something that maybe um, is interacting with the container, like we'll see in a little bit, um, might be able to want to like muck around with the internals in here and switch up the configs to intercept the transaction or interact with an entity manager or something so that your test can test things it wouldn't ordinarily be able to do. That's very important, so we'll see that. Gray box is a term that um, I believe we've come up with. I believe it's Oshlox, actually. Maybe not, Pharrell. No one wants to take uh, credit for that one. Um, it's kind of, as the name implies, a combination of black box and white box, where you're starting off from the outside, but you're going to inject something inside that's going to be able to receive stuff, and then when it comes back out again, you'll see the response. So it's a nice hybrid model. Um, I believe that's something that we're doing first or we've identified, but I'm not exactly sure. We'll have to see. There's regression testing, which will make sure that, you know, once you have um, bugs in place, you fix those bugs, you make a test case for the bug, and that test is now in place to make sure it doesn't regress back to the previous state. Um, there's smoke tests. Smoke tests aren't really tests in and of themselves. Uh, a smoke test is a subset um, uh, a smoke test is usually a smoke test suite, and the smoke test suite is a subset of probably a larger test suite. So in JBoss Application Server, we used to have like thousands of tests, and you couldn't possibly run them all on your machine before you committed. So what we used to do was run a series of smoke tests. It was like a sampling of like 50 tests that would test 
the EJB, the web layer, the JMS, <coughs> just some stuff to make sure that like at least the components were like kind of hooked in together. And they say where there's smoke, there's fire, which means that if any one of these things fail, probably you've got like a real serious systematic, uh, systemic level problem going on. Um, and there's also like load, stress, and performance testing, which is, as the name implies, uh, putting your system under load, seeing how it handles that. Um, and you can do all sorts of great things from that because you're not really doing assertions on those tests nearly as much as you are placing stress upon your environment to see how it performs, but also, more importantly, how it scales and how you can predict usage patterns. So you know if you've got some sort of a problem where you start to add users and it's great at 10 and 100 and 1,000, but then it starts to like really degrade in performance, even though you've got some sort of a geometric problem and you've got to solve that to make it you know, maybe a linear, but much better a constant time or linear rhythmic type of a thing. Um, I'm sorry, a logarithmic type of a thing. Linear rhythmic would be just right on here. Um, so at the smallest level of testing we have is the unit test. We're all familiar with this. Anyone unit testing? Anyone unit testing Java EE stuff? Anyone, like how, how are you unit testing your Java EE components? In the black shirt. So he's got many layers. He's trying to isolate the logic as much as possible. This is great. Um, and Java EE, you know, starting at EE5 became a POJO component model to try and encourage us to be doing these types of things. You know, in, in prior versions of EE, it was, um, yes. I'm sorry? Oh, why would I talk specifically about Java EE unit test? What do I define as unit testing? Oh, um, I define unit testing usually as a single API call. It's at the lowest level. And that's a general rule of thumb. I go into integration when it deals with the interaction of two or more components. I unit test my hash codes and equals methods on all my value objects all the time because the mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Right, you say the word unit as if unit is some sort of standard measurement. Like a unit is any arbitrary amount. So again, I don't, I, when it comes to most of my software development practices, I don't strictly adhere to very much. As a guideline, I say an API call. But more generally speaking, I say use your head. Uh, if you're interacting with two or more components, then you're definitely dealing with an integration point between two. If this is really an isolated case, you said isolated, then yeah, that, that in my mind would be a perfect candidate for a unit test. Does that help to answer your question? Okay. And the second part of that was, why do I speak to it uh, in the context of Java EE? The reason I speak to that in the context of Java EE specifically is for just the reason you mentioned, which is the use of mocks. Java EE is a component model. And as a component model, it lets us do very complex things in very simple ways. But there are side effects. We're still doing very complex things. We're just letting a container give us services that enable to do it in a much more efficient way. So we're doing services like injection, transactions, security. And when you use mocks or you instantiate an EJB as a POJO, got news for you, that's just a POJO. It's just a regular object and you're neglecting most of the runtime environment. So if you're only doing unit testing or you're only testing your enterprise uh, components as objects, then you're missing a large portion of the picture. Coverage in your running app comes from the full complement of all the bytecode that's in the machine that's, that's being executed, not from just the bits that you write. And this is a very important distinction. 
Um, so this brings us to the unit test now, right? Or this brings us to the integration test now, where we say, all right, look, uh, we've got many things that all need to in integrate with one another, and um, we've also got to integrate with a container. And the problem with integrating with a container, historically, has been that containers are kind of cumbersome to work with. You've got to do your own test setup. You've got to do your own test harness. It takes a tremendous amount of time and knowledge to be able to integrate these things and put them all together. It usually leads to bespoke solutions to like put this all up. It's, it's just very messy, right? So um, what we try to do is give you tools that are going to enable you to have all the benefits of a full-scale integration test, but make it look, read, and write like a unit test. Um, and that's been going to enable this. We've all seen this term, continuous integration. What does it mean to you? You. Awesome. Because <laughs> I actually don't know, uh, and I was hoping someone would help me out here. Yes. That's a really good, yeah, that's a really good uh, elevator pitch for continuous integration. There are a few tenants that go on here um, that are, I think, I think they were first laid out by Kent Beck in his book, uh, Extreme Programming. They were definitely adopted later as part of the Agile Manifesto um, with you know, Kent Beck and Fowler and Ward Cunningham and those guys. And continuous integration is about, yeah, having, um, having a source code repository. It's about having a build server that's going to build these things. I think when the paper was first written, it mentioned something like nightly builds or whatever. But you know, since then, we've gotten much better with our infrastructure, and we can now kind of do tests on every commit. The JBoss application server now works based off topic branches in Git so that every commit we make is made to some fresh branch that's isolated from all the other mainline development. And then what we do is we run all of the tests on just that branch with just that change. And if it passes, then we will then promote that commit into the mainline. And we've got a lot of people contributing and all working on this. So to have that process automated, automation is key here too. Um, you get this kind of continuous integration solution. So it's really the merger of having source control and a build system that's centralized and a way of handling the changes and merging them all together. It's, it's a workflow, okay? But it all stems on the fact that there are tests written in the first place. Otherwise, you've just got a really brilliant system put in place that will run nothing. Um, see, I memorized the slides. How proud am I? Automated deployment actually is a new um, is is a newer is a newer tenant here. Not originally in there, but you know we've now got the ability to do automated deployment into the cloud from some sort of a trigger, maybe a Git push or something else. Um, so continuous development is the name of the book. It's me, Ashlock. It's our colleague Dan Allen. You may know him um, from Seam Team fame, and he had also written uh, Seam in Action, a very popular book from Manning. And we've kind of come across, all right, we've, we've got a little bit more than this picture of continuous integration. We really need to be stressing this continuous development. It's not about testing. It's not only about integration. Yes, it's about all these things. But we also need to be enabling people, especially in Java EE, to develop Java EE code in a testable fashion. And um, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, especially since a lot of it's largely left untouched by the specifications. And... Um, because of that, there's no kind of like rules to the road for how to go forward. So we said when we write the book, yes, we're going to write it about the technologies that enable this, but it's really going to be focused on the use cases, and the use cases are some of the things that we're going to see today. I have got to hurry up through these slides so we can go see them. Uh, our philosophy is generally this. Uh, tests should be portable to any supported container. By that I mean if you are running a CDI test, you should be able to run it in any CDI container, be it Weld, or open web beans, or I don't even know what else. Um, tests should be executable both from the IDE and the build tool. It shouldn't take separate steps, uh, it shouldn't take separate custom plugins or anything to be able to execute these things. We've already got JUnit runners and TestNG runners, and they're supported by Ant and Maven, and like every IDE under the sun, they've kind of become standard. So if we can like piggyback upon that type of adoption, then we don't have to like provide our own plugins 
and we don't have to impose any new stuff like a build system upon you. You can just kind of choose whatever you got. Three, the platform should extend and integrate existing test frameworks. I kind of hinted at that with the JUnit and TestNG thing. These are test frameworks, they work really well. They give you a life cycle for your tests. So if we can piggyback on top of that life cycle and now give them some services and support, we're in great shape. Um, the demo app is one that is running right now. Um, we're gonna come back to it, but if you would just come in and you haven't yet like checked this out, you can go online and put some data in there and uh, we'll see it in a little bit. Um, for your reference, the book and the URL are here. I think we can just dive into examples at this point. Yeah, okay. So um, the first example we'll show is probably the most popular question that we get. How do you deal with persistent data? You know, it's like, I'm sorry? Yeah. Um, we have uh, entity objects and JPA, and starting in EE6, we've got um, Bean validation spec led by our buddy uh, Emmanuel Bernard, who uh, I believe just gave a talk on it or is giving one pretty soon. Anyway, um, Bean validation is pretty awesome. It allows you to annotate on your beans um, a single entry point, say, this is an email address, or this has to follow some regex, or it's got to be a number larger than X, or uh, it's got to not be null, you know? And this, this one definition is going to be picked up by some of the disparate technologies within the EE platform, and your view layer is going to know about it, so you'll be able to validate on the view, and if you've got some sort of a JavaScripty thing that generates stuff, it'll be able to be picked up on it and validate on the client side, but definitely be uh, validated by um, Hibernate, which is going to might, might generate your schema and it'll actually put um, the uh, the constraint on your on your domain. So you've got like the same type of restriction at many levels, but only one place to put it. So that's real nice for keeping track of things because we don't like to rewrite things all the time. So we talked a little bit about this unit testing thing, and we can argue whether this is really a unit test or an integration test because yes, it's integrating in with Hibernate Validator. And yes, it's got a couple of objects in play, but it's not integrating with like a true backend container. What we're doing is we're manually going to take our entity and manually uh, bootstrap Hibernate Validator and run the checks on it. And this is a dead simple JUnit test class with nothing special about it. There's a before method, which is going to execute um, once per test method, then there's the test methods, and it's gonna go and run. So uh, this is our entity, you'll see that the entity has a series of bean validation annotations on it. On top of name, name cannot be null. Uh, the duration cannot be null. Sessions have to be valid. Um, so we'll just run the test and we'll see how quickly that goes. Right, pretty cool. Um, unit tests also typically classified as being ultra fast. This, in our estimation, is a great example of a unit test. And again, you can come down on me for saying it's really an integration test, but like for the purposes of this discussion, it's definitely much more unit than some of the stuff that we're gonna see in a little bit. Um, unit tests, they should be fast, they should have like minimal dependencies. Um, and this, in our estimation, is a great example of a unit test because it fulfills the contract and it doesn't involve too many other players and it keeps things fairly componentized and isolated. The reason we don't like mocks is because when you test using a mock, you change the environment. There's a scientific principle that says you cannot observe without affecting the environment, and with a mock, man, you're really affecting it because you're injecting like test-only logic in there just to stub out some sort of a method. Like if you want to do mocking on a JMS topic or connection queue or something like you've actually got to like get a whole mock object to get that stuff because they're not directly you can't instantiate them by spec their interfaces and there's abstract classes you've got to build them out in some sort of a fake thing you're relying heavily upon your mock implementation so in that case we say yeah you absolutely need to be integrating in with a container same thing here with our data model right so now we've, you know, we've checked here that our um, validations are, you know, that they're in place and that some junior programmer can't come in and accidentally remove that not null check or whatever and it's not gonna like mess up our world and we'll get real quick feedback. But let's go dig a little deeper. 
we're going to deal with some actual data that works on this entity. And um, in this case, data is really only kind of, it's only helpful to interact with data if we've got like a data set of like known data that we want to validate against for our test method. In other words, we're probably going to want to like pre-populate the database with something useful that's known or return it to a known state. We might want to keep the changes afterwards or we might not want to, but in any case, we don't want to do a whole bunch of setup. So anyone not yet familiar with Archelian? Okay, half, half of us here. I'm going to give you the, like the real Cliff Notes version. Uh, Archelian is a test platform. It uh, enables you to write your integration tests as you may write your unit tests. It is a component model for testing, much like Java EE is a component model for your business logic. And it uses a lot of the same standards. You can inject things into your test. Most importantly, what this is going to do is it's going to delegate this runtime out. It's going to get this deployment by the deployment annotation. That becomes your deployment, not a real var, not a real jar, not a real ear. It's the result of this deployment method. It's going to deploy that into the server, a real server, and it's going to then start to execute the tests against that server inside of the server, white box, and then return us the results, okay? So for all intents and purposes, Archelian is gonna be uh, the thing that enables us to integrate with everything else without writing any code. That's its job. Additionally, we have an Archelian extension called the Archelian Persistence Extension. And what this does is it enables us to put these annotations atop of the test methods that say using data set. And they're going to take a YAML file. YAML's a uh, simplified data format that allows you to put a whole bunch of data in place. What this is going to do is interact with the database, throw that stuff in there before the testing, and then when you go do your tests, you can actually validate against the data that you would put in there and like run assertions to make sure that things are hooked up correctly. We've got different options for what to do with the data afterwards. We can either leave it in place, or we can say, uh, you know what we're going to do? We're going to um, use transaction rollbacks, and we'll say, okay, start a transaction, run the test, and then let the container automatically uh, set rollback only on the transaction. So the transaction rolls back without an error, but rolls back, and then any of the changes you make in the test and during the pre-population here are like thrown away. They never make it into the database um, because of the isolation of the, of the environment. And, and like nothing is affected outside of the test environment here. Um, so we can run this test as well. Has anyone yet not seen JBoss Application Server 7? Well, kind of seen it. All right. AS7 is fast. It's like seriously fast. And when I think of where we were just a couple of years ago when we were doing these demos, it's amazing because we can deploy this. We can run this anytime, I guess. Um, and as we said earlier, we wanted to be able to run tests strictly from uh, the, the build tool or from the IDE or whatever with no other um, extensions or anything. So um, we just want to go run as JUnit test and have it all work. You got some ports open already? Yeah. Um, doesn't excuse the fact that like when we have running servers, you can't like boot up to and have them share a port. Uh, Unfortunately, I haven't figured out how to hack around that yet, two applications sharing a port. But um, when you run the thing, you'll see that you know, we'll, uh, we'll connect in and fire up to the container. We're going to take this uh, test class, throw it into the container, run its tests, do the data population, and report everything back to us. Um, so this is going to, going to enable you to, yes, do your testing, but do it with some real data and get a sense of, of how this may act uh, when you've got like your database in an expected state. And it relieves you of the uh, it relieves you of the task of having to like maybe execute a script beforehand or afterhand, it makes your whole thing simpler. We're all on board with this, it's not conceptually difficult. I can move on. Cool. Uh, we'll also oh yeah, and right, as we say, it's integrated in with the IDE. We didn't do anything special here. Run as J unit, and that's it. And everything else is abstracted for you, right? So this is going to be a chapter in the book dealing with data, and you know, we'll go further in depth. Um, we'll start in on our next example, which to me is like one of the most amazing things. There's so much going on in this tiny bit of code that it's, it's unbelievable. 
And it's a real testament to Oslock's work and to Corel's and to like the whole Archelian community, um, a whole bunch of other guys over in the QA department, um, or the quality engineering QE department at JBoss. Um, these QE guys are amazing, by the way. Like they, they work on our supported products and they're heavy users of our stuff. And recently, they've become very involved in the developer community of the upstream as well. So like a lot of these testing projects are, are fueled by them and their requirements, which is exactly how it should work. Like we're not relying upon our QE department to like just write tests for us and run them and manage the Jenkins environment. Like they're, they're defining what testing should be. So they're true engineers and it's awesome. Um, anyway, this example here, um, it's gonna use the view layer. Um, I think Oshlock might be better off, better equipped to start rapping about this one. Right. So it goes a bit upon, upon the idea of continuous development as well. Because when, when you think about integration testing, you kind of have to have, or when you're doing the big bang type of integration testing, you have your full application done. And then, then you start to, to do the integration testing. And with continuous development, you will, uh, the, the idea is to continuously also do the integration testing. And to be able to do that, you, you will need to be able to uh, ex extract out subsets of, of your application as, as you're developing it. And with the, with the help of Shrinkwrap and a couple of the new features in, uh, in Archelian and within the Java E spec itself, you can start to isolate the different levels. So in this case, we have, uh, in the original JSF component, it is expecting there to be an entity that is coming up from the database. But the JSF component itself is not, the, or does not patch that, that entity. It's just, it's just looking for, uh, for something to provide the current conference object. And somewhere else, someone defines how to produce that current conference object. <coughs> so that allows us within the test scope uh, to create our own fake producer of this. So we're skipping deploying the, the actual uh, producer who will fetch the entity from the database and we're replacing it in our test deployment with a producer who can take an argument that we have, have given it. So uh, we start to run through what this test is going to do. Uh, first, the first bit is the deployment, where we're packaging down our conference beans and, and the JSF component itself. But we're, but we're also adding then the test, test conference producer. Uh, we're using Selenium here to, to poke at the remote uh, HTML inputs, no output. And since Archelian is the one controlling the deployment and controlling the server, it also knows where this thing is deployed. So, can, so Archelian can inject back the URL to the web context. So that allows you to, to not ha have to care about if this is running in a test server or on a, or on a staging server. And if we have left it at this, we would have been doing what Andrew was talking about as being the black box testing. We'd, we're just poking at at the remote APIs. But there is a, a, a extension to Archelian that's called warp. And what that does is it lets you, during a normal uh, HTTP request, you can piggyback server objects as well that will be executed within the life cycle of that HTTP request. So, uh, this is the warp bit. So when we're doing a, a uh, driver get on the client side, warp will then piggyback this setup conference object that we feed with our specific entity that we say we, we want, we want to, to have this view render. And then <clears throat> when, that hit, when, when that hits the server, before the servlet uh, uh, or before our JSF request starts, we're then fakely producing that entity that someone else originally supposed to produce. And so when the, the actual JSF page is, 
if executed in the server, <clears throat> excuse me, the the um, the object coming from the from the uh, <clears throat> client side is available to the JSF, and it would just render it as if it came from the full integration. So now we're separating just the view layer out to to test it. So we're creating here on the client side the, the the conference object. We're setting the values, executing it, and verifying the output. One more step of this test is that when you use, normally using Selenium, you are uh, stuck with doing all the 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 ID or fetch element by ID or by CSS and all those rules, and they kind of become very unmaintainable after a while. So you have the JSF components on the server side, but on the client side, when you're testing it, it's not any nice API. You have a bunch of strange rules. So a sub, or another sub project of Archelian is the um, the the Archelian Graphin, which is a wrapper around WebDriver. And it, if you're familiar with the Selenium page objects. This takes it to the component level. So this is fragments within a page can then be handled in the same fashion as a uh, as a web uh, sorry page object. So we're saying that somewhere in this page that we're calling, there will be a element. Uh, there will be an element with ID conference, and we're going to inject and populate for you the 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 object object so you have a nice view to. Uh, a nice API on the test side to to interact with, and these become reusable test components. So if you have the same component spread across multiple uh, multiple um, test cases, these will typically uh, contain things like get list or next or previous, depending on what kind of component it is. And you then just have to change that those specific statements uh, in the component instead of having to go and and update that across all the tests if the HTML or if the backing HTML would, would change. So, right. So we're creating the conference object on the client side. We are executing uh, the URL to push it, the object's being created on the server side, and when it comes back, we're interacting with the page object, that is the, the API for the, for the output. So if we just run this now as is, again, it's just a simple run as a unit test. So it doesn't look necessarily very fancy, but if we start to do some breakpoints here to see what's going on. So that should be on the client side. And <coughs> at this point, on this other side. So let's run the in debug. So now we're, we're about to call the URL and warp in the background and now add it up the, the setup conference server object to, to the URL. So that will be piggy, piggybacked on that request. We're coming in from the, uh, anyone can see that at all. Uh, it's coming in from the JB, sorry, the, um, the remote runner in, in Eclipse. And the next breakpoint. We are actually inside the uh, the the server of the HTTP key request on the uh, app server, and at that point you could have uh, within here you can do things before and after servlet. You can do it within the different life cycles of uh, of JSF, so before render, after render, and all the different steps. And you can do similar, like you can do in the test case, you can here inject your EGBs or you can uh, inject your CDI beans and operate as if you are part of this, the same component model as your report itself. That's a pretty neat little trick. 
So here we're really getting into the, the gray box testing that we were talking about before, where, I mean, what, there's an amazing amount of things going on here. It's, it's initiating a, a client request, uh, it, it's sending it off to the server, it's intercepting um, at the servlet level inside the server and telling the view layer, hey, use this data model instead, the data model that the client provided. And then when the server renders it back out, the client then grabs the full response analyzes it and sees that, um, that, the, that the view layer stuff is in expected form. I'm sorry? Here? Oh, right. Oh. <laughs> it's extremely well. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you were intercepting where, oh, we've got it at the view layer, and now um, there are even tools to parse it out so you don't have to parse out the ridiculous HTML. You've got it in like an object model format that looks and feels much friendlier. So this is like my, the favorite example I, I think I've ever seen ever in, um, in, a, in a demo because there's just the level of control we have. Like we're, we're kind of mocking the data model, but we're not mocking it in a fake way. You know what I mean? And, and you do kind of get some separation here. You don't need to go all the way to the database. You can like very quickly just see what the page will look like if you gave it different types of data. You know, like what if you've got a user that's got a ridiculous name from some country that has ridiculously long names or something doesn't wrap too long or doesn't whatever. And you know, you, you, because you're plugged into Selenium, you get like the full output there. You can take screenshots and you know, do whatever you want. So um, this is a cool example to me. I think probably we should move on. If that's, yeah. Uh, the word that's on everyone's mind lately, or at least we've, we're now sick of, um, is cloud. Yeah. Uh, I was sick of cloud before cloud, before it was cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but then I started using it, um, and it's awesome. And I don't know, there should be like buy mon cloud con, just bi-monthly cloud conventions all the time, because it's just, it's that cool. Um, here's what I do with cloud. Um, I'm a developer. I consider myself fairly technically uh, capable, and I used to have this like server. I paid like a few hundred dollars for it, and it's a nice machine that runs kind of fast, and I was running my own build servers on it, because I wanted access to my own Jenkins, and I was using it like for my own applications, and it was just a good testing grounds for stuff. And like, I just kind of like happened to notice over the, uh, like the course of a year and a half that like I had just like slowly started to migrate my own applications off this thing until I realized I was just like running a big fan in my apartment that wasn't doing anything anymore because I'd moved everything off because it was easier. I didn't have to like SSH in and deploy my apps. Everything was just like a git commit and it was all done. I wasn't setting anything up anymore. Um, so from Red Hat, we have this OpenShift. Has anyone uh, heard of OpenShift yet? Dude, OpenShift is real cool. And I'm saying this not because I work for JBoss and Red Hat and not because I've got like any special pull with that community. I mean, I signed up just like anybody else and they gave me free instances to use just like anybody else. And um, it's, it's just, it's given me a, a tremendous benefit. Um, in my projects, we actually run uh, the Jenkins servers over on CloudBees. CloudBees is great too. Um, they've got like this, they give you like a master instance and you put all your jobs in there. And then when I do a git push, it'll like send it off to one of the slaves. And so I get that nice continuous integration like through them and they provide that to me as well. And that's awesome. Uh, so CloudBees is pretty cool too. But so now we've got like our applications on the cloud. The demo app that we saw um, earlier that we linked you to. By the way, I saw some of the comments, and they're not all friendly. But you have to refresh this. Um, we have. I can't read the screen. How am I supposed to see that? Well, I walked right up. That's <laughs> how I read it. Um, but we'll take your feedback. Again, all the content is like on the blog. Um, uh, love the hat. And hate the hat. All right, that's that's good. Okay, so, um, and there's more entries too. Actually, there's, there's oh. two more on the next page. I guess. 
Your handle for the election. <laughs> <laughs> Open shift is one letter away from a nasty typo. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> so we've got this app. It's, it's running up there. That, that app was kind of like generated by Forge. It's actually like a continuation of the application that we had in our talk on Monday. And um, uh, it'd be cool to interact with this. Um, again, we say with testing, you want to be testing in an environment that's as close as possible to your production server. So, like, you know, if you're running AS711 on your production, then you should probably be testing with AS711 locally. But there are going to be environment differences. There's, like, different hardware, there's different whatever. Let's say your production server is on OpenShift or it is on the cloud. Man, it's really cheap to, like, make an exact clone of that same environment and use it as a staging server. Or because they're so cheap, use it as your own personal staging server. You know, if you've got some sort of a problem, maybe... There have been times that I've been developing and there's stuff that I can only duplicate in production or on my staging server. And digging in there to figure out what's going on is not always easy. So we're going to show you three things that you can do to interact with that. Um, we'll actually show you one and we'll talk about the other two. Because the other two just kind of, they're open shift and network dependent and they're going to burn too much time and we're going to move on to other things. So uh, the first one is what I call um, a cheap trick. And that's not a burn. Cheap tricks are great. They're cheap, meaning that they're easy and they're quick. And they're tricks because like, they're really effective and they look pretty impressive and they do a lot of good without a lot of effort. So um, even if you do know OpenShift, maybe you didn't know that there are a couple things we can do to make uh, working with it easy here. This is JBoss Developer Studio, and it comes with an OpenShift plugin. And once you've hooked up to your OpenShift instance, you can right click on it. And there's an option called OpenShift. Um, oh, well, it depends on which server. If you're on the servers tab, it says OpenShift. Here you can go straight to port forwarding. Um, we can activate port forwarding on our machine pretty easily. And what port forwarding is going to do is it's just going to say, like, all right, anytime we access the local ports on our local machine, just, like, send that off to our OpenShift instance and make it look... Um, um, and, and make it look like we're hitting localhost, but really the port forwarding is going to take over and we're going to hit OpenShift. So that's easy. We don't have to like plug in our remote URL to like make a connection or anything. We'll just say OpenShift, right? Um, another thing that we can do here, um, let's show the market file first. Hmm? Let's show the market file. Oh. Um, OpenShift works um, with a series of marker files. And so the way this whole thing works is you have your repository, and in the repository is a directory called .openshift. And if you look inside there, there's a file called OpenShift Markers. Now, uh, by default, this Java 7 marker will come in there, and that'll say, hey, run AS7 with Java 7. If it's not in there, it'll go with Java 6. Um, there's a readme, which will tell you about the different marker files that are supported. One of them is one that's not in there by default. It's called Enable JPDA. Does anyone know what this is? I knew it. Like this is a yeah, it's like a, this is a, this is a standard um, Java runtime switch in in the Oracle uh, Java runtime, um, where you can open a port on uh, you'll you'll let the JVM open up a port, and that port is used for remote debugging. So you can attach a debugger right like through there. I think we're also used to like doing debugging through our IDEs and whatever. We don't kind of we've gotten out of the habit of manually saying when the JVM starts up to like open up a debug port, but you can. And uh, by enabling this option, it just kind of instructs OpenShift to say, all right, when you start up the app, enable, enable uh, and open up a debugging port. And because we've got port forwarding, we're going to be able to get at it through localhost 8787. So at this point, all we've got to do in uh, our IDE is uh, go to the option that says remote Java application and give it the host, which is going to be localhost, because we have our port forwarding on, and give it the port 8787, which is where it's listening, and hit debug. So at this point, now we've got like the app out there, it's running on OpenShift, it's on the cloud, and we've attached a debugger to it. So we can actually hit that instance and put input in, to it and hit debuggers, and it'll wait out on the cloud for us, just like it were if it were local. 
But there's another side effect that we can do here, um, which is the notion of hot swapping. Is anyone familiar with hot swapping? Yeah, hot swapping, not something you maybe traditionally do in like a standard debugging environment, or maybe you do, and sometimes you'll notice like things disconnect and they don't. Hot swapping has its limitations. Uh, well, first it's feature. The feature is that when you're connected in through a, a debugging environment, you can replace code and you can change business logic. Um, it has a lot of restrictions. The restrictions are you cannot change the structure of any of the class files at all. You can't change, you can't like add or subtract methods, you can't uh, add new classes and expect them to go in, you can't change class hierarchies, that kind of stuff. But if your structure is already in place, then yeah, all of your local method variables and any type of your business logic in there, you can change that as the thing is actually running. Um, so while we're connected here, maybe let's do that. We have, uh, are we connected? It's waiting. Oh, it's waiting. Um, again, it's a remote connection, so it might take a couple seconds. Um, and we're connected, and oh, and you'll see you're connected because you get the stack trace. Uh, you're gonna get the, the um, not the stack trace, you get the running threads, your thread view. And if you were to put a breakpoint in any of those threads, then you would get, um, you would get the stack, the, the frame, the call stack, right? We've all seen this before. So we've got our, our page, which is our feedback um, entities remotely um, up there, which we've seen. Um, why don't we show the, we'll show the page again, we'll remind people what they wrote. This is not all complimentary, actually. Um, so maybe what we'll do is go back into the IDE and see what it looks like if this is a little bit more positive. Um, so, you know, we'll, you can just go directly into our entity and we'll find the place where the entity replies out what the feedback is and um, we're just going to say that everyone agrees that this is so cool. And the second we hit save, it'll hot swap into the remote instance. You have that uh, null check in there? That's the side effect of it. I don't know if it swapped in or not. Well, we definitely broke it, so that, that's, you know, something changed. That's wrong. I may have actually forgotten the business logic that it was involved in. Return this feedback equals now. No, otherwise. Eh. I knew I should have changed something right before the presentation started. Um, but you get the point. We have, I mean, we clearly swapped something in. If, if Ashok were to, like, delete that and he puts it back in place, there it is. Um, that doesn't make any sense. No, we're changing stuff. I forget exactly what the logic is I put in here to make this whole example work. But it is pretty cool. I think we can all agree on that. What's that? Oh, that was the first problem. That's why. Oh, that was the why we would have the null. Oh yeah, set, if but, you, yeah, if you mm. just do that, then like it breaks the whole, or it like breaks the whole view layer. For some reason. For some reason. Uh, yeah. More units. Obviously. I honestly don't know what's wrong with it, um, but that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> this is fire. It's terrible. This is the Mars. This is the Mars rover crashing and wasting millions and millions of dollars because someone changed something right before they tried to squeeze in one last feature because it'd be real cool. Um, right. So this is one way of interacting with the cloud, and uh, I promise you it works. And I've put an error in my business logic here, and you can blame me for that. But um, I think we've very clearly illustrated that yes, you can attach a remote debugger, you can get your breakpoints, you can swap in your code changes, and you'll see them reflected on the remote instance, including the bugs that you introduce, you will then put on the remote instance. So if we can all agree that that's pretty cool, and like, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Tangible yes. Pandering to the audience is always like one of my favorite things to do. Uh, but there are two other ways to interact with the cloud um, that we've got for you. Um, one of them, is to um, do, as we said before, this continuous integration environment. And um, how are we doing on time? Uh, <laughs> I think we've prompted them. We've got five minutes. Uh, one of them is to have this continuous integration environment. So OpenShift also has a Jenkins 
um, available cartridge. And what you can do is you can log in. Um, I'm sorry, you make the cartridge and then uh, push any changes to your app. They'll be tested by Jenkins. And then you just you, you set up um, a set of call triggers that say, like, all right, if the build succeeds, now automatically push this to staging. Or if the build succeeds, automatically push it to production. So now you've like fully automated your chain here so that you've like you can really get that incremental development all the way to production just by like putting in a git push, having a feature branch check out if that thing passes, going to staging, and just like all the way along the chain, uh, all the way along the chain, get these continual improvements without the big bang release cycle or without having to like manually intervene. And again, that's all enabled by having confidence enough in your test suite that says, all right, if the test suite passes, this thing is good to go. No, I want to look at it. I want to click through it. I want to see it with my own eyes. If you've got confidence in your test suite, you can go to production. And that's enabled by really putting testing at the core of your development philosophies. That's the second thing you can do with the cloud. The third thing you can do is use Archelion just as we did uh, to deploy to a local JBoss AS server here. Use Archelion to deploy to an OpenShift server. And now you've got the ability to have your local tests and a local packaging unit deploy the packaging unit remotely on OpenShift, and then run the tests there in that environment, shut it down and report back to you locally. So instead of using a local JBoss AS environment, use the JBoss AS environment up there, but you know, get the results back. And, and that's the third thing that you can do. And that's the Archelion OpenShift container, and there's links to that in the blog accompanying this talk as well. Um, we've got a couple other examples that were also in in the abstract, and we, we've done what I feared we would, which was kind of get into this. And I want to leave some time for you to ask questions or interact or tell us where we think we fell short uh, on the examples or, or really anything. So you can just kind of shout it out. Yeah. Right. I'm sorry? Yeah. What's your backing server? Yeah. It's, it's AS7, it's... Glassfish. I mean, and how quickly is Glassfish at deploying your stuff and starting up and stuff? Okay. I mean, it's, it, Archelion's not going to make Glassfish faster. Uh, no. Uh, as it is, uh, a suite, the suite level will start and stop the container. The test class level will issue a deployment, and each test method will operate on the same deployment. So if you have 300 tests in one test class, then yeah, it's all going to be one deployment, test, 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 test undeploy. Yes. Right. Not for each test method. No. Um, and again, if you use like slimmer, faster servers, and that helps you out too. Um, right. Go ahead. To make the deployment be on a suite, uh, it's our number one request for the Archelion project, and it's we've, we we well. yeah we've got it slated. We can't do it without some major API changes. Um, so it's it's will absolutely be in 2.0 and Oshox. We've been we talk about this kind of all the time, and it just it's about our planning for when 2.0 is going to come and when he wants to like you know break the 1.0 API essentially. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, we want to we want to decouple the events handling that happens from the like test lifecycle and give you greater control over like, what happens when. Yes. I mean, I got I got you next. Sure. What's yeah, what's the external provider? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, so like, mox is kind of an overloaded term. But something that I've seen is like, look, if, um, for instance, in Java E, a lot of this stuff is coming through a data source, right? So maybe they've got like, maybe some Oracle database that you don't have access to because of the licensing fees or whatever, and that's what they run in production, but you want to test against it. Your contract isn't necessarily with an Oracle database. It's probably like with a data source or some abstraction layer. So I would try and find that abstraction layer and then fill it with something else. So in other words, like mock that data store, but find a, find a good place to have that abstraction. Oh, it's an API. You gotta mock the backend. You gotta mock, you gotta mock the backend API. You gotta have some sort of a service. Yeah, I mean, if you've got an API contract to fill and that's where your view ends, then yeah, you absolutely, if unless you've got access to the back end container, we, we can't give it to you. Like we can we can help you get over that gap quicker, but if there's nothing there to get to. I don't think what you're asking for is conceptually possible. No. To help with mocking? Makito framework for you know object mocking? Yeah, I mean, Um, we'll stay here and do questions. We've also got these cards with some links and stuff. If anyone needs to head out, you can grab one. But we'll still take questions. I mean, whatever you want. Oh, thank you.